Glory to God. Now, as you're joining in, you can share me and invite your followers, share me on your page and say, Lord, I received the prophet's reward. I have a powerful word that I'm sharing on here right now. And um, I want to say this, all of my partners love you so much. Thank you for everybody that so into me, that share my broadcast, that copy my words to your pages and all the help that you give me, all of that. Thank you so much. Now, this is going to be powerful. I'm going to be sharing something on here for the next couple of minutes. But I also want you to keep in mind this, that you should stretch your brain to remember the scriptures. Your mind remembers what you speak more than anything else. So when it comes to memorizing scriptures, one thing that you want to catch is that if you want to remember the word of God all the time, start speaking it for memorization's sake and ponder upon it so that you can get a revelation of it. The more you think about the word of God, the more God talks to you about the revelation of it. And when you have revelation, that's when your behavior and your lifestyle change. You can't keep on doing something just because you're told to do it. The only way that you could keep on serving the Lord is through revelation. So revelation is a dimension of the Holy Ghost. That's why Apostle Paul in Ephesians was talking about the spirit of revelation. Because the spirit of revelation is the dimension of the Holy Ghost where God is tattooing his mindset inside of you. The power of revelation is that it energizes you to change. It energizes you to produce. It energizes you to release the anointing. It energizes you to serve. The purpose of revelation is to charge you into worship. It's to charge you into worship. Revelation gives you momentum to commit to something that God has assigned you to. So what can we say about Jonah? He wasn't operating in revelation. That's why he had no commitment. What can we say about Saul? He was not operating in revelation because no commitment. Wherever commitment is, revelation is reigning. That's why the commitment can actually occur. Nothing in this life Will, 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 will produce any commitment other than revelation. So the only reason why we see the disciples at the cross like John and Mary Magdalene and Mary, the only reason why we see them at the cross is because of revelation. Revelation comes from meditation. And meditation comes from you training your mind to remember the word of God. And you can easily do that by speaking it with your own mouth. Once you speak it with your own mouth, you will remember it. And whatever you remember will cause you to surrender because that memorization is stuck inside of your soul, is tattooed inside of you, and it takes over your behavior afterwards. Um, John chapter 8, verse 31. Or uh, let's go to John chapter 15. <laughs> John chapter 15, verse one says, I am the vine and my father is the husbandman. And in verse two, King Jesus began to go on and say that every branch that is in me that beareth not fruit, my father takes away. And in verse two, chapter 15, King Jesus then went on to say that, but every branch that's in me that is bearing for, uh, that is in me, he purgeth it that it may bear forth more fruit. And that's John chapter 15, verse 2. Uh, no, that's John chapter 15, verse 2. And something that I caught in verse 2 was this, in John chapter 15, verse 2. King Jesus said, every branch that's in me, every branch that's in me that beareth forth no fruit, the Father takes away. 
Now, as I was meditating on this, what was shocking to me was this. King Jesus claimed the person that wasn't fruitful. Even though they wasn't fruitful, John chapter 15, verse one, he said, I am the vine, my father is the husbandman. In John 15, verse two, it says that every branch that's in me that bear forth not fruit, he taketh it away. Now, how does the father take it away? It, it, it means detaching from the body and sending into hell. It is eternal damnation. Taken away is like having a condemnation on you to be doomed to hell, fire, eternal separation from God, where Satan rules, where Satan torments and demons terrorize. So John chapter 15, verse two is so glorious because it shows that even though the person is not fruitful, the Lord Jesus is still saying, this is mine. John chapter 15, verse two. Um, John chapter 15, verse three says, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Now you are clean, John 15, verse three, through the word that I've spoken to you. So it shows you that the word of God, its job is a bleach, to be a bleach to your soul, to clean you. That's the job of the word, to keep you in the, in the cleansing flow. So how God considers you purged and clean is when the words that he speak is constantly dominating your thought life. So I want you to think about this. In the times where God's word does not dominate your thought life, you're filthy in those moments. Now you can easily switch that. But anxiety, fear, worry, stress, um, self-condemnation, distractions, uh, being out of control, all of those things are places of filth. So saints, I want you to hear, hear this, and you, you ain't never heard this like this before. A person that is depressed is filthy. Depression is filthy. And that's why even in some cases when people get depressed, they don't even want to take a shower. They actually do the behavior where there's physical and visible filth. Depression is filthy. It's not a state of being clean because when you clean, you get joyful. See, joy is the place of being cleansed. Um, inspiration is the place of being cleansed. So for the rest of your life, when you see certain things happening, you can know where you're at mentally. You can either know, hey, I'm in joy, or you can say, okay, I'm, I'm in the cleansing place. And if you're not, then when we deal with uh, being depressed and being discouraged, that's how you know that you're in a filthy place. But when you're in a clean place, you'll walk in wisdom. When you're in a filthy place, you'll walk in folly. When you're in a clean place, you'll walk in the joy of your salvation. When you're in a filthy place, you'll walk in weary, weariness. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, Do not be weary in well-doing, because you, you will, you'll reap if you faint not. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9, the power of that is this, that the Bible lets you know there, that uh, well-doing is a place of being clean. Weariness is the place of being filthy. So while you're doing something that's making you clean, that's carrying the place of being clean, you could easily be interrupted by filth. And when that happens, you shut off the clean place that you're in and you become filthy again. Now, saints, hereby you understand why one minute, you, if, you, if you are an emotional person, you can say, I feel the fire of God. The next minute, you can, you can feel offense. You can feel anger. You can feel 
upset. You can feel uh, damaged. You can feel disrespected. You can feel impatient because if you're wearing a white outfit, it's easier for you to see the dirt. If you're wearing a black outfit, the outfit could be dirty and you never recognize it. What I want you to see is that Satan has been a professional at putting on dark garments on you so that you don't see the stains. If it's a white garment, you can easily see it. But when it is a black garment, you can pour juice on it. All type of things can happen, but you won't know that it's dirty. And so the same way in life, when you're not spending time with the Lord or, or, or you see the, 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 um, the disloyalty to stay excited about the word, the readiness for God to call on you, the continuance of studying, submitting yourself to the anointing, doing all those different type of things, right? That is where you keep yourself clean. When those things start weaning off of you, you can get filthy. Um, there was something in the Bible where... Um, there was a Pharisee and there was a tax collector. A tax collector was considered very evil, right? But the Pharisee said something that caught my attention. He said that he fasted and he gave his tithes. I think he said that he fasted twice a week, I believe, and gave his tithes, which is he gave money. He was a tither. I don't want to say he was a soul. I want to say he was a tither because he did say he gave his tithe, which is 10%. But see, he was doing the activity of the tithe. But the activity of the tithe wasn't doing him. He didn't let the tithe touch him. So, so... The activity was clean. His heart was filthy. Because he never meditated on what he was doing. It was just a ritual. That's why meditation is so powerful. Because things have to be inward. It can't just be outward or it die off. If it's inward, it's going to die off. That's, what, that's why if you do anything for eye service for people looking at you, for people praising, it's going to die off because it, it, it was never inward. It was just an outward thing. So if we look at that story, right, how is it that he could be tithing and fasting and not be changed? See, fasting and tithing is clean, but what he took something that was clean and kept it on the outside. He never let it touch the inward man. So John chapter 15, verse two says, every branch that is in me that bear forth not fruit, the father takes it away. And every branch that's in me, the father purges it so that it can bear forth more fruit. What, why is the father purging it? Where is the father purging this branch, which represents a person that's connected to the Lord? A branch is an individual that has a friendship with God. So how is the branch being purged from the inside? The mentality, the focus, the schedule, the desires, the appetite, the dwelling place of where your mind is, what you're concentrated on, what you're focused on. You see this? And so it's, it's, it's inside, it's not outside. So the person is being purged 
in John 15, verse 2, and then John 15, verse 3, he says, you are now clean by the word that I've spoken to you. John chapter 15, verse 4 now deals with, if you abide in me, then you will bear much fruit. You can't bear fruit if you don't abide in me. That's John chapter 15, verse 4. So think about this. King Jesus, John chapter one, 15, verse 1, he's dealing with positions, authority. He's saying you underneath my authority. I am divine. That means that without me, you can't do nothing. The father is the husbandman. What is he saying? My father gave me the power to empower you. So you come to me if you want to live successful with God. You stay in tune with me if you want to be successful in getting into eternal life. If you want to be successful in fulfilling your destiny down here on earth. That's John 15 verse 1. John 15 verse 2 deals with branches being in Christ but not bearing the fruit while they're in Christ. Why? How could you be in Christ and not bear fruits? Tradition. The traditions of men make the word of God none effect. Now, I want, I want to say something to you that you probably never thought about before. Distraction is tradition. Because when you're distracted, nothing that God says can affect you. And when it can affect you, that means that the power and the, the anointing that that word carries, you'll never see it happen. Tradition. Inside of tradition is distraction. When you're distracted, the word becomes none effect. Not only is tradition a uh, distraction, but tradition is also offense. Because when you get offended, your ability to hear shuts down. That's why you see if somebody gets stopped by the cops, if they get offended, they don't listen. They don't listen to instructions no more because offense shuts off your hearing. The same way, um, God knew that when Lucifer turned against him and got offended, that Lucifer wasn't going to hear from him. The same way with Adam, God knew that when Adam got offended, he wasn't going to hear from him. So God drove him out of the garden. Offense shuts off your ability to learn. When you're offended, you can't see straight. You become a crook that only can see crooked. When you're offended, you can't see the future. Prophetic anointing leaves when you're offended. When you are offended, you cannot see in the spirit precisely from God. When you get offended, your, your, your spiritual goals die off. So you probably made a goal, say, I'm a walk in love, I'm a walk in forgiveness, I'm a walk in strength, I'm a walk in consistency. But when you get offended, all that dies off. So these are powerful things. Always remember, and that's why King Jesus said, blessed is he that is not offended because of me. Because when you get offended, you can't hear King Jesus no longer. And so, of course, you become a victim, a slave to every other spirit other than the Lord. John chapter 15, verse 14 is telling you, you can't bear fruit unless you abide in me. Now, John chapter 15, verse 4 is so powerful, right? Because he's talking about abiding in me. That's the only way you're going to be able to bear fruit. If you don't abide. So what does that mean, abide? John chapter 8, verse 31. John 8, 31 says this. You are my, uh, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. That's John chapter 8, verse 31. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. So John chapter 8, verse 31 says, if you abide in my word, if you continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed. John chapter 8 verse 32 says, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What you want to see in John chapter 8 verse 31 is that he used the word 
continue in my word. If, so it's conditional. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples. So if you don't continue in the word, then he don't consider you a disciple. Now, the last word that he used in John 8, 31 was powerful because he said, you are my disciples indeed. So you can be a disciple according to mercy. God say, you my disciple, I pick you, right? But when it says, you are my disciple indeed, it is solidified by your behavior. is solidified by your actions. So the last word in John 8, 31 is saying that your discipleship is finalized when you yourself can look at your fruit and see that you're continuing in what I taught you. First Peter chapter five, verse 10 says, and the God of all grace who has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After you have suffered a while, may he perfect you. May he establish you, strengthen you and settle you. First Peter chapter five, verse 10. The God of all grace. You notice the Bible says the God of all grace. See, there's different graces that you can receive from God. John chapter 14, 14 says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So you, you, you could ask and pull on graces. The grace comes from God in every section, even for the mind, even for the words, even for the consistency. You should receive grace for endurance. You should receive grace for joy. You should receive grace for wisdom. You should receive grace for sanctification, grace for purity, grace for studying, grace for learning, grace for sowing seed, honoring the anointing on your prophet, grace for reaping harvests, because harvests decide your progress. A harvest decides how far you will travel. It decides the dominion you have to accomplish kingdom assignments. A harvest is God giving your life a makeover. It is the glory giving your life a takeover. It's through harvests that now you have more authority to demonstrate the kingdom. But 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, and the God of all grace that has called you to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. You notice 1 Peter 5, 10 says that he has called you to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. By Christ Jesus. Why did it say Christ Jesus? Because see, that shows you that Christ is an office. Because if he could have said Jesus Christ, but it says Christ Jesus, because it's not dealing with a name, it's dealing with the functionality and office. So he has called us by the office of Jesus. And what is Jesus? A dominator. Not a slave to sin. Who is Jesus? Rich. Because Second Corinthians 8, 9, that you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he became poor, that through his poverty you might be made rich. So he has called us by Christ. That's the office. And here, here's Jesus, the example of the office. <laughs> so Christ is the position, but Jesus is the performance of that position where you can look at Jesus and see how Christ is a place where you're empowered to do thus and thus. <laughs>